going to start. Let's deep dive into our first session, Shifted for Good Mobility Today and Tomorrow. And our first speaker, our first guest on stage is already a real highlight, coming all the way from California. You all know that the whole automotive industry is at an inflection point. Electric vehicles, software-defined cars, all of them are already, and will even more in the future, shape and influence our driving experience. And all these new, these future, these connected cars, of course, they need a next generation technology. And that's what we would like to talk about now in the next 30 minutes. So please welcome on stage in about a minute, Nakul Dugal, he's Senior Vice President and General Manager Automotive at Qualcomm. But first, we start with a video. Nakul, what a start. It's such a pleasure to have you. Please Great to be here. To take your seat. Wow, that was a really nice video. Yeah, thank you. I'm very excited about automotive at Qualcomm. Yeah, you are. And I just, you know, I just mentioned it in, in my introduction. We all know the industry is changing, and it's changing rapidly. I mean, if you just think back like 10, 15 years ago, the automakers makers were like, okay, we'll bring around a new design and everybody will be woo, but that's not anymore. And it's, it's being that much faster, especially talking about cars. So maybe you can share with us your ideas on all the trends that are actually now shaping the automotive industry. Yeah. What do you think? What are the key focus topics? You know, it is, it is such a unique time in uh, an industry that is the size of automotive and transportation really in general, because, you know, I think electrification, first of all, uh, has accelerated significantly. I think even uh, moving faster than what was expected a few years ago, big transition in terms of uh, being uh, carbon neutral, uh, moving, moving uh, off fossil fuels over towards the grid. And that, I think, to me, is one of the biggest catalysts in terms of the pace at which the auto industry has to embrace the change that is upon it. I think the other piece that is... Uh, you know, pretty clear to us as we all start to live a digital life is that the platforms that we use are always connected, are always changing. Uh, we have the latest at our fingertips. And the car is, from that perspective, not a very different platform, but it has to evolve. It has to be able to embrace that same modernization. So that opportunity is massive, but also complex because the car is not you know, a simple platform to Is it more uh, chance or a challenge? Well, I think it depends upon your perspective. Uh, I think uh, when you are dealing with uh, a lot of complexity, cultural complexity, global complexity, the scale of products that you have to go deliver, the cost challenges that you have, versus if you are starting from a clean sheet of paper, I think it's a very different starting point. But I think, uh, you know, at least what we see, and we, we have this very unique position in the industry where we get to see what everybody is doing. Uh, I can't think of a single automaker that is not seriously embracing the complexity and trying to figure out what does it mean for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, the car as a software platform is very powerful because uh, I think it uh, enables so much more to be able to go to with that platform. It expands the value of the platform over its life. Uh, but it also requires you to, uh, you know, you have to think about how you engage with the product that is a car differently. How do you buy it? How do you service it? What changes? So Absolutely. tremendous amount of change, which is good, which is, which is where opportunities start from. 
we embrace the change here. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so more future trends, more, more trends shaping the whole industry right now. Yeah. Look, I think uh, automated driving, uh, autonomous driving, uh, driverless cars, robo-taxis, uh, the cars becoming safer is a massive trend. And uh, what I would say is I think the last five to ten years, I think the industry is spent in really embracing uh, how uh, you can make the car uh, really a robot on wheels mm -hmm. uh, to different degrees of uh, complexity. Uh, I think uh, it's a combination now of uh, the resolution of the sensors, what kind of compute capability you can add into the vehicle, what level of uh, software complexity you can realistically deploy and then evolve, and then uh, how do you change consumer behavior in, term, in terms of being able to embrace that uh, level of capability. So safety systems are becoming very standard and uh, cars are going to become more intelligent in terms of avoiding collisions. I think that we are already in the middle of that. That's a big area of focus for us. But as you start to move towards more and more automation, it also depends upon what kind of uh, driver behavior you are uh, uh, encouraging. So are you encouraging drivers to be uh, and taking more risk? Are they monitored? Are they disengaging where they should not be? And I think as is pretty clear from you know, what we read nowadays, there are a lot of opinions in that specific area. And then finally, there is the aspect of just moving towards a driverless future, which I think is going to become relevant, but again, from a controlled environment perspective, because that balance between what can you geofence, what can you offer as a service, versus where do you actually start to change passenger vehicle behavior. I think those are maybe at the opposite ends of the argument. Absolutely, absolutely. So when I heard about Qualcomm first, uh, it was always a connection for me just to, to smart, smartphone devices. Right. So yeah. I think that's the same with all of us. Yeah. But you have made a, a really, really strong push in the past yeah. like months and you've all even more in the next years. Um, into the whole automotive industry. Uh, can, you, can you give us some, some insights into your whole strategy? Sure, sure. So, you know, Qualcomm, I mean, it, this is, uh, you're right, we are a smartphone leader. This has been our core business for many years, but we are a systems company uh, at, the, you know, at, the, at the heart of the company. And, uh, you know, funnily enough, when we started our business back in 1985, one of the first commercial programs that Qualcomm started off with was related to the telematics business where we set up... Uh, from the ground up, it was a fully vertically integrated solution called Omnitrax, uh, satellite-based telematics for trucking. This was back in the late 80s. So the relationship with transportation actually goes back a really long way. But I think for us, uh, over the last, I would say, 10 or so years, what has become very interesting is that so many platforms are getting connected to the cloud. And uh, that is the starting point of a platform becoming uh, modernized. Now, you know, we build uh, semiconductors at scale. We do a tremendous amount of software. And so for us, what was quite evident about 10 years ago was that the car is going to become this next platform that will change. And uh, there are going to have to be catalysts, trends, that are going to accelerate that change. Mm -hmm. And we have to be prepared for what those catalysts might be. So we've been connecting cars, uh, you know, with our modem technology for over 20 years. So that's not new for us. Uh, and that's become more sophisticated, more complex. But we uh, stepped into the application processor space about seven years ago. Uh, we partnered with Audi, who actually brought us into the infotainment business uh, with the Snapdragon digital cockpit platform. And we learned a tremendous amount through that engagement because uh, we were not building products for the auto industry back then, obviously. But what we learned was that uh, the cockpit has actually become this very interesting uh, canvas for the OEM to be able to get their brand identity out to their consumer. And it allowed us to be able to think about our products in terms of how do we shape them, because smartphones is one use case, but the car is really a very different use case. So that was a very, uh, you know, timing-wise it was great, because we embraced that opportunity, and we are now a leader in the cockpit space. We supply to everybody. And that kind of you know, gives you a sense as to when we think about technical problem statements and business opportunities, we really kind of uh, make that turn very quickly. The journey into ADAS is, again, very similar in automated driving because it's really about bringing on a lot of system complexity into a fairly tough technical uh, uh, solution. You have to get the right uh, performance. You have to run it at low power. 
you have to deal with a variety of different uh, software configurations, you have to do it globally, you have to do it for various cost points. So not, not a simple problem uh, to not. solve. And so those are the types of things that we embrace. Yeah. There are for sure some topics we will have on that stage during today for, yeah. for a couple of time because yeah. there's much more space needed to, to discuss it uh, at the end of yes. the day. Um, yeah, we just talked about this whole area of digitalization, which is around all of us, not only when talking about cars, but now that I have you on stage here, what do you, what do you think? How will all of these digitalization change our driving experience at the end of the day? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the holy grail is that the car, when you enter into the vehicle, it gives you this experience that you enjoy, that you want to spend time in, that is differentiated. And uh, because we have so much of digital technology in our lives, and we are surrounded by our phone all the time, there is always this question around, does the phone follow you in the car? Do you create a new, unique experience? And I think it's a combination. I think you really have to think about how is the car unique for the types of things that the car can do. And uh, it comes down to, you know, what experience you're trying to drive. Is it automated driving? What are the things you can do? Are you trying to get entertained? Is it music that you're enjoying? Are you looking to, uh, you know, get a lot more information? Are you using the car for productivity? So I think it's, uh, and that is why to me this transition towards a software-defined vehicle is a very powerful concept. Because what it does is it makes the platform that is the car very versatile, very flexible so that you don't have to limit yourself to, here are the things that my car can do. That experience can evolve. But you have to be able to allow your digital experience to be able to get into the vehicle, what your day looks like, uh, can you take your calls uh, within the vehicle. And to me, that is where the opportunity is, that's also where the challenge is, because it requires a tremendous amount of software sophistication to be enabled at scale. Uh, and frankly, that's where we spend a lot of time with our customers, is to really be able to build a cockpit experience that uh, uh, reduces the burden upon automakers mm -hmm. as you start to go bring this integration of uh, your life outside the car and your life inside the car together. It's also, I think, a kind of ac acceptance from, from the person driving the car, how much do I want that? That's right, that's right. And, and, and there is no one single use case. Everybody is looking for something slightly different. You know, it also is very different across different geographies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what we see as pattern in China, very different from pattern in other parts of the world where you have a local ecosystem that people are used to and that ecosystem follows you in the car. How do you go enable that? So, uh, another major trend is productivity. A lot of people uh, use their car as their primary uh, office on wheels. What kind of capabilities do you need to be able to have access to from a, from a digital experience perspective. Uh, electric vehicles have a very different type of uh, set of requirements in terms of uh, charging, the navigation that you require. So it's this blend of uh, how do you bring your digital life with you in the car, but then how does the car also a little bit bigger than uh, you know, what your normal life might be in the office or at home. But again, it offers so many opportunities, so exactly. <laughs> let's, let's embrace. Exactly. Look, that's oh. kind of what it comes down to, is that it, there, there's this continuous canvas for uh, keeping on uh, innovating and reinventing what, is the, uh, what are the possibilities. Yeah. So as we do have uh, lots of different people as well here in the audience, um, when we are talking about a software-defined uh, vehicle or a, a software-defined car, maybe you can explain first to us what does it mean and yeah. uh, what is it and how uh, will that influence and how, which role will that play in the future of automotive? Yeah, yeah I, I like to break it down into three high-level categories just to make it very simple. I think the first piece is if you think about, uh, you know, I'll use a technical term which is mechatronics, which is mechanical behavior of the vehicle exposed through electronics in the vehicle. And the first piece is mechatronics, which is how do you make software be able to access the mechanical elements of the car? How does the car drive? What can the car sense? What is the car surrounded by? Cameras, speakers, microphones, uh, various types of sensors. And if you are able to bring that layer of abstraction then what that allows you to do is to not worry too much about the hardware in the vehicle. You are really focused on developing with APIs how do you actually control that hardware. So that's kind of the first layer. I think the second piece is uh, to be able to build a relationship between the customer and the car. 
And that to me is actually very central to this entire story because uh, automakers have traditionally built hardware products with software features in them. But you almost have to turn it on its head and ask the question, can you actually build a relationship with the product that's going to have a life of 10, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. without having a software-based relationship? And that really gets back to your previous question around what is the digital life? How do you actually go enable those pieces? And, and then I think the third piece, which is very important, is the, you know, the, you know, what is known as the second life or the third life of the car. What is the residual value of the vehicle after you drive off the uh, dealer lot? If you sell the vehicle, what happens to the vehicle after that? If you think about a battery electric vehicle, the life of the battery is 20 years. So it is quite reasonable to assume that the car will be, you know, will have two, maybe even three owners over its life. So how do you design that vehicle such that it's going to have all this different capability that will change? What kind of software do you design? The life of that software over that long a period of time where the hardware is not changing? That's where the complexity is, but I think that's also where the big opportunity is. And I think what it does is it brings in a brand new ecosystem of, uh, of players, of players that understand enterprise software, cloud software, uh, really customer relationship management with the end vehicle. And that is the transformation that the auto industry is going through in that if you have to start to sell a product that is a software first product, how do you sell it? Who will sell it? How will you manage it? How will you support it? So I think we are in the, you know, I would say the first decade of that transition. Well, I think it's, it's very, very important. When you, when you bought a car like 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, it, f it finished at that point. It, it doesn't develop anymore. But now if you, if you buy a car, and we're talking about the software in between, it can go on learning. And that's something like I'm, I'm very, very much looking forward exactly. to it <laughs> personally. Um, yeah, you're doing a lot. You mentioned that before with the advanced driver system, uh, system and also when talking about autonomy. Um, how do you personally and as a company envision the whole transition to this self-driving industry and self-driving vehicles? Yeah. Two sides. Maybe that's the difference between your personal opinion and the company one. Yeah, I think, look, I think uh, uh, safety systems in cars to me uh, actually uh, need, need to have a continuous improvement because I think the technology is there uh, and uh, that I think we have to embrace. In fact, I think my my personal opinion there is cars are, of course, becoming a whole lot safer. You don't typically see the types of accidents that uh, you used to that could be prevented, that are collision avoidance type, uh, uh, type challenges. Uh, I think the technology is there. It is at scale. And I think every automaker is deploying it. What I also like about uh, how this space is evolving is that there is a lot of innovation possible around collision avoidance because it is actually a complex space in terms of, uh, you know, the various uh, geographical scenarios, the various scenarios in terms of low speed versus high speed, highway driving versus urban driving. There is a lot of technology innovation possible, and as you build products that are more capable, you can keep increasing the bar. So that, to me, is here, and it is evolving already. Then if you start to think about automated driving, that's where I feel like... Uh, you have to be keeping in mind safety first because the whole idea is to actually reduce accidents, reduce fatalities. That is the purpose of having this conversation. And it is a complex conversation because you really have to be able to put technology on the road for people to experience mm -hmm. and uh, do it in a very responsible way. Uh, I feel like some automakers actually do a really good job in terms of making sure that uh, when they introduce features, you know, like we work with General Motors and they have put uh, super cruise on the road now for many years. And what we like about that approach is that it is, all, it is always focused on making sure that you have the right level of engagement from the driver. So if the driver is not being responsible, then the system will warn and then disengage. And what that does is it makes sure that you have a safety first mindset. You are uh, enabling new habits, new features, new capabilities but you're doing it in a very careful manner in that the focus is on convenience, but not at the expense of safety. Uh, now, you know, this is software and a lot of compute and sensors, so you can deploy it any which way, uh, but I think doing it the right way is very important, and I think that's the approach that we see most automakers taking. Uh, 
And then, of course, the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, the ultimate goal is to be able to move towards driverless or, uh, you know, L4, where the driver doesn't need to be engaged, which I think is certainly possible for specific, pre-planned, uh, highly controlled environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you have to really think about it, I mean, just as a layperson, what I would say is you have to look at the risk reward. What is the risk in deploying this? What are the benefits? There are clearly economic benefits to drive out of this. And I think uh, in a lot of these scenarios, the role of infrastructure is very important. If you have markets, if you have parts of the world that are actually modernizing infrastructure for these types of capabilities, you can actually accelerate the, trans I mean, the transition clearly. But if you're trying to deploy it on infrastructure that doesn't have that capability, you are taking on more risk. That to me really is the uh, conversation. As far as the technology goes, I think we have enough processing. I think sensors are improving. The software will be there. I think that's kind of the uh, path that we are on over the next 10 years. Yeah, controlling the environment is always a problem. I'm thinking the same. I'm, like, I'm a good driver, but what about the others? <laughs> so it's, it's also, you mentioned that, very important. We need to talk about who is responsible, who is in charge. And um, whenever you talk about autonomous driving, lots of us have in our head, like, okay, I'm sitting in my car, I'm turning around my chair, and I'm drinking my coffee or watching my film, and then the car will bring me from Munich to, to Hamburg in six hours, perfectly fine. Is that uh, a vision you have as well? Or do you say, like, we still need somebody to be in control? It's like an, more than a system than real and autonomous driving. Well, I mean, like I said, you have to think about the risk uh, yeah. scenario. And, you know, it really comes down to uh, if you have infrastructure that is deployed, that is designed to allow you to be able to go do that, I don't see why you would not be able to, because the technology certainly exists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think your previous point about how are other people driving, so if you are in an environment where you have all of these other... The problem is never with me, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so I think if you are able to design a system that is highly automated, where everybody is, uh, you know, meeting the same types of... Uh, uh, the same types of rules, if you want to call it that, of course that is something that is possible today. The question really comes down to when you get the driver to disengage and then have an expectation to remain disengaged and the car will take over and get you to a safe spot, in what scenarios can you reasonably manage that? If you expect the driver to re-engage, how much time do you need to give to the driver? Is that realistic? Mm -hmm. So this boundary where you're essentially moving from the driver being in charge to the car being a robot, but then you want engagement back, that's where the answers are very hard and uh, really very hard to answer because it comes down to uh, the infrastructure, which part of the world you are in, what type of environment you're doing this in. And you know, you, at the end of the day, we are talking about getting to very high reliability before you would trust something like this. And I think you know, there is enough nowadays in the press where there are a large number of automated vehicles on the road, and you hear about accidents, and you hear about technology failing uh, some basic capabilities, which wasn't the idea. The idea was to, come, was to make cars safer. So. Uh, this is going to be, I think, uh, a push and pull. Mm -hmm. But over the next year, 10 years, I see absolutely there is going to be a lot of responsible efforts towards uh, adding more automation where it makes sense. Okay, so last question. I know it's, it's always difficult to talk about short-term goals and long-term goals, but let's say for the next five years company side, now that you're working together with the automakers, what's, what are the most important topics on your to-do list? Let's say for the next five years. It's a long list. Uh huh. Uh, I can see. <laughs> well, you know, I think one thing that has uh, clearly happened over the last five years or so, uh, as we have embraced the automotive opportunity, is that uh, the value chain has changed. So the traditional value chain of uh, a tier two supplier to a tier one supplies to an OEM, that's not the case anymore. I think it's become much flatter. And what that does is it requires a company like us to be much more tightly connected with the automakers directly, which is a great opportunity, but also brings on a tremendous amount of responsibility. Uh, so I think we are now uh, working with a large number of automakers. Uh, we already have been, but in terms of uh, the advancements that are being driven uh, across their various vehicle platforms in, I would say, the 25, 26 time frame, there is a lot of work going on there at both the semiconductor level, the software level, the service level. Uh, 
I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, technology evolution, uh, you know, we are trying to do more uh, with semiconductors, more complex software, more limited periods of time, higher levels of autonomy, uh, and that obviously is pushing the envelope really for the entire industry and us included as well. And that to us is actually a great opportunity because uh, you, know, you, don't get, you don't get many chances to actually be able to influence an industry that is the size of automotive uh, many a time. So we find the position that we are in as one of you know, great, great privilege, great responsibility. Uh, I think the third piece that to me is really very exciting over the next five years, which will happen, which is happening, is this transition to software-defined vehicles, where you will be able to enable new experiences in the platform that is a car after it is uh, driven off the lot. And that to me is very compelling because uh, it's going to change the way people experience a product that they are very used to. So it's not just the buying experience, but what actually happens to that product over its life. That to me, I think for all of us, that would be quite an exciting, uh, so lots of things to be excited about, but uh, yeah, these, these would probably be the top ones. So what's the thing you are personally looking forward to the most in all the changes that are happening? Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, w what I look for now the most is uh, the car that I buy needs to have technology that we created. <laughs> so that for us is, uh, actually, that for me personally has actually become very important. I, my, my car buying decisions and my family's car buying decisions have changed because I want to make sure that we are buying something that we were a part of. But I think, uh, I think it really comes down to uh, experiencing uh, these products from a very different vantage point, from a very different perspective, just because, uh, you know, look, I think the one thing that is great about the auto industry is that the people that we work with that build cars and that are in this industry are so passionate about these products. And these are complicated products to build. A car is not like any other consumer product that we know of. And uh, it's highly complex. It requires a lot of things to go right, a lot of people to come together to, to kind of play their part. And so to see all of that come together and then experience the product that is uh, built is something that is uh, really very special. You know, there are a lot of people that wake up in the morning and say, I wish for, and then it happens. So <laughs> maybe right. we should implement that into our yeah, life as well. Exactly. So we're talking about wishes. That is actually my, my final uh, question, because whenever I have a panel, I, I ask people, like, what do you wish for? Like, where do you want more help, more support? Um, and most of them are saying, like, uh, we're going on the political side, less restrictions, and so on. So I'm asking you the same question, to, to bring all that stuff we have talked about in the past 25 minutes, to push it forward, to bring it yeah, on the road, like we say. What would you wish for? Where is more help needed or more support needed? Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, I've been doing automotive now at Qualcomm for about 10 years. Uh, a few things that uh, the business has taught us is, uh, you know, you have to be very realistic uh, in terms of what is possible. That's not uh, how wishes is, uh, started. Yeah. But uh, you know. I think it is very important to actually keep in mind that uh, at the end of the day, look, I think uh, we are actually moving very quickly. From where we were five Absolutely. years ago to where we are today, I think we, we are actually, even as a technology company, moving very, very fast. So I don't think there is as much in terms of what to expect from the auto industry. I think there is a lot that is happening already. Uh, I think uh, there is a lot of fragmentation. Uh, there are a lot of things that uh, are reinvented where you have to question what is the reason to go reinvent, because frankly, if you compare the car as a platform to some of the other platforms, you don't have so many different ways of doing the same thing. And that holds back progress. That holds back the pace at which you can move. On the other hand, it is the nature of the industry because it has evolved in a very different way and it is going to consolidate. So you really have to think about uh, motivations and incentives and complexities and challenges of the industry where it comes from, and then be able to find a path through that. And, uh, you know, frankly, the one, um, the automakers that we are working with that are thinking five years out are uh, thinking around those challenges. So that to us is important because once you start to see that path, then you know that, you, then you know that others will follow. 
So. Perfect, Nicole. Thank Great. you very much. I'm Pleasure keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> for you. I think you have an amazing path ahead of you. Thank you. Thank so you much to much. do. Thank, Thank you very much, Pleasure Nicole, for joining us today. That Thank was you. a great opening of our Shift 2022. Thanks Thank a lot. This is your much. round of applause. Thank you, everybody.